Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out to church today. I want to wish you a very Merry Christmas, and I hope you enjoy the Christmas time. And for some of you regular attenders, I just want you to know, yes, I do own a tie, okay, just so you, so you know that. Um, it's, it's great to have you here. You know, as we look at this whole Christmas idea and Christmas season, I think we're all familiar with, with seeing this kind of a scene, you know, the nativity scene, and it's got... You know, Joseph and Mary and the, the baby Jesus there and these, uh, the animals and the shepherds. And it kind of, as, we, as we look at that picture, it, it brings all kinds of thoughts to us. And, and some people, you know, maybe don't think much of it, but many people, they just cherish this. This is a, this is a, a thing that means so much to Christians, to followers. There's millions and millions and millions of people around the world that this is an amazing occasion to them, and this, that we celebrate this, that Jesus Christ came to this earth. He came and he was born in a manger, and his very purpose for coming was to save mankind from their sins, and he came as the Savior of the world, and it's just awesome, and that's what we sang about today. That's what Christmas carols are about, telling that amazing story about what Jesus Christ did for us. And as we think about all that, and, and most of us, I think, have this joy in our heart this time of the year, just remembering, remembering that Jesus Christ was born as a human being for us. And as we do, it's just, it's just awesome in our, in our hearts. But here's the, the question I think about is this, is, is when you and I, or, or you are at work and you're forced to work overtime, and then you're tired and you're on your way home, and you're stuck in traffic, and you're not moving anywhere, and you think, what does this have to do with my life? And I know it's great to think about it now, and I know it's great to rejoice, but you know what, next week when you're at work and doing that, or, or if you're a stay-at-home mom and you're you know, dealing with the kids all day long, you're trying to keep them clean, the clothes clean, the house clean, do the meals, do all the shopping, do all the stuff, and when you're in the middle of that, where does this scene affect our lives? How does this have anything to do with the pressures and the stress and the difficulties of our life? I mean, our regular, day-to-day, -day, normal, sometimes mundane, sometimes incredibly high pressure, many times a struggle every day in life, and we really ask ourselves this question sometimes, and that is, what does this scene have to do with our life at all? Or or how in the world, and I, I'm serious about this, how in the world does this scene really connect with our life? And, and how does this scene, you know, relevant at all in our life? And, and not only this scene, but I think there's other things in life that I, I know that I ask myself a question sometimes, when, especially when people, when people kind of say, and I'm talking about pol politicians or, you know, uh, movie stars or entertainers or something who, who, who claim they have, they have really advice for life, and they say, like, you know, we really understand your difficulties, and we understand your problems, and, and we're here to help you. And I ask myself the same question with that. It's like, how in the world can these people identify with my life? How in the world can they have any way of relating to my life, understanding my life? And, and I think about this often as they, they have great speeches and they tell us great promises. Like, how in the world do you relate to our life? I, I just want to look at the last, few pre, last four presidents that we've had. I, I just want to tell you something. These, these guys, they're great guys. Uh, some are Republicans, some are Democrats. That's not the issue. They're wonderful guys. I think they're well-meaning and all of that. But here's my question. How in the world can they relate to normal life? With money like that. I mean, look at, look at the, you know, George Sr., $23 million is what he has. And Bill Clinton, $55 million. Even George W., $35. Barack, $12 million. The, these guys have so much money. How in the world can they relate to you and I? And kind of the life we go, we go through. And, and same with movie stars. There, there was one I, was just, I just heard, a movie star that, that, that has a hundred, over a hundred million dollars just, just to their name. Like how can somebody with millions of dollars relate to our life? Because as I wonder, as you look at these people's lives, I, I, I wonder, like can they understand and they can, re, can they relate when it's cold outside and you got a flat tire and you got to get the, the, 
the jack out of the back and jack it up? Or, or can, how, can they relate to the fact that sometimes you and I have had to save up to buy shoes for our kids? Or we wonder how we're going to make the next house payment? Or, or, or we really, really struggle to make ends meet from month to month? I mean, can these guys, honestly, can they relate to, the, to a regular life? They, they don't have jumper cables in their cars. They, they have somebody drive them around. They fly wherever they go. They eat at restaurants you and I would have to take out a loan to eat at. Okay, and they, they, they do this. It's just their lifestyle. Listen, their lifestyle is so far above our lifestyles. How in the world can they relate to the average American life? They're, they're, they're so different. They, they don't deal with the same things we deal with. They, people clean their houses, get their clothes, tailor, make everything. They, how in the world can they relate? And, and, and I think sometimes, and there's probably many of us here, who we think that very same thing about God. About God. How in the world can God relate to my life? You, you know what I'm talking about. God, he's in heaven. I mean, God's in heaven. He's all powerful. He's got all this glory. He sits on a throne. And yeah, he's there. And yeah, I, I know that he sees everything that's going on. You believe that. But, but sometimes I think we wonder, how in the world can God possibly relate? How, how can God affect or be a part or understand the struggles, the pain, the difficulty, the stress, the emptiness, the fear? that you and I live through and live with and face in everyday life? How can God up there really connect and understand and be real in, in our lives? He's so far above us. And actually, for the last few weeks in church, we've been talking about lines from the song, O Holy Night, and how this Christmas carol along with so many other Christmas carols, really so accurately describe the mission of Jesus Christ, why Christmas, what this is all about. And I want to read these lines of the, of the Christmas carol. It says this, The King of kings lay thus in lowly, lonely manger in all our trials born to be our friend. That actually to answer the question, how can God relate or understand our lives? Is that Jesus Christ became a human being and came to this earth. That Jesus Christ came to earth as a human being. Jesus, who was God. Listen to what the Bible says about God. Now it uses the word, uh, the word, but this is talking about Jesus. This is what the Bible is describing. Jesus says, in the beginning was the Word, or was Jesus, same thing. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, through Jesus, all things were made. Without Him, nothing was made that has been made. And the, the, the Bible is telling us this, that Jesus Christ was, is God. He's always been. He, he lives in heaven. He created everything. He's in glory, and he's, and he's God, and he's over everything, and he rules everything. And you can just imagine that, that Jesus is God, and everything is at his fingertips, and he's in control of all things. Why in the world would God ever leave that and become a human being? It's mind-boggling. Why would God do that? Couldn't he do whatever he wanted to do from heaven? I mean, couldn't God just kind of fix whatever he needed to fix or, or speak or do whatever he could do or how he could run the world? Couldn't he run it from his throne in heaven? Why in the world would God ever become a human being? And the answer to that question is because he not only tells us he loves us, he not only says, I understand, but he did it so that he could relate 
to our lives. He did it for that reason. So that he could relate to you and I. He became like us. So that he could relate to us. He experienced everything you and I experience in life. That he didn't want to hear about it. He didn't want to watch it. He wanted to go through it. So that he could help. He could be a part of. He could understand. He could empathize. He could work in our lives. Matter of fact, the Bible says this about Jesus. It said, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. And it goes on in Hebrews to say this. Sorry, there we go. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted. He is able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus Christ left his glory in heaven and became a human being, and he suffered everything that you and I suffer. He suffered every temptation. He suffered every trial. He went through and experienced every difficulty. It's another place in Hebrews that says this. For we do not have a high priest, according, referring to Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. That Jesus Christ came to this earth as a human being to empathize and to understand and to experience everything that we experience in life. And you're, you're, you might be thinking, yeah, really? I mean, did, did Jesus really experience everything? Well, he never had problem with his computer, his, his modem or anything. I got that. He never had problem with his car. Okay, so he didn't have some of those. But I'll tell you what he did. He experienced every emotional difficulty you and I have. Maybe different circumstances, but the same feelings and same emotions. I know that some of us, maybe you here today, maybe you experience from time to time just feeling unimportant. Maybe you, maybe you just feel like, really, it, it, I've been there. You ever, you ever feel like, like, man, I get up early in the morning, I drive to work, I gotta have a car so I can get to work, work all day, drive home, eat dinner, take care of some chores, because I gotta go to bed so I can get up and go all over again the next day. And, and seriously, this just feeling, I mean, have you ever been there? Have you ever felt just unimportant? Or maybe right now you just feel like, really? Is this all life is? I mean, I get to look forward to a weekend once in a while or maybe a vacation, you know, once a year. But really, like, it, life, you, you ever just feel like, man, there's no, this is not a big deal. This is, this is, is this worth it? It just, it just seems like it's so routine. It seems like there's nothing in it, it seems like it's, it's not exciting. It seems like it's so boring. Like, is this all life is? I just have to go through this. Jesus felt that way. Jesus felt unimportant. He felt the very same thing about day-to-day -day routines. Get up, go to work, do this thing. Because Jesus did some amazing stuff, but because of Jewish law, Jesus didn't start his cool stuff until he was 30 years old. 30 years. For 30 years, Jesus had to work around the house. He, had, he was a carpenter. His dad trained him how to be a carpenter, and he was a carpenter. And for 30 years, Jesus got up in the morning, went to work. He didn't even have power tools. I mean, that really would be a drag. And he's a carpenter. Works all day in the sun. Comes home. You know, has an iced tea. <laughs> Not hard iced tea. Iced tea. <laughs> and, and no TV to watch. He watches the sun goes down. And he goes to bed just to get up and do it again for 30 years. I can imagine he felt many times, oh, can't I hurry up and get to this? I, I came here for a mission. Can't I do that? Just feeling so unimportant about that. 
Or I know some of us, as a matter of fact, if you're here today, maybe, maybe you are feeling overwhelmed. You know what it feels like to be overwhelmed? I think especially in our culture, it's so easy to feel overwhelmed and tired. You, you know all the expectations that we have. And, and some of you are probably just drowning in this. You just, you just feel like, I can't do it anymore. You're just overwhelmed with the schedules and with all the pressure and the things of life and money and finances and family. And you got to run the kids here and you got to be there for them. And people have all kinds of expectations on your life. And you need to make more money. You got to buy this and you got to provide that. And, you know, well, we want to go here. We want to go there. And you got you to please those friends. And you got to be this kind of person at work. And, you know, and then there's church, you know, and you know, oh, they expect you to do this and that. And you you get, and you feel all this pressure in life, and you just feel sometimes like, I'm just, I'm just tired. I'm just tired of life. And, and maybe when you're in that situation, maybe you have thought sometimes like, I, I feel so overwhelmed with everything. There's no break. You might think, where's God? Where's God in all this? How can God possibly understand this? He's in heaven. He wasn't always, because he came to this earth, and Jesus Christ felt overwhelmed at times. He knows the feeling. He's been right where you're at. I mean, the Bible describes stories of Jesus. He was up. The Bible says this. He got up a great while before day. It was his normal practice. I mean, he would get up early before the sun came up, and he would go and pray. And then he would go into ministry and he'd be surrounded by people. He would be surrounded by mobs of people and everybody wanting something from him. And, and some people he pleased and some people he did a good, something good for these people and those people yelled and got mad at him, you know. And he, so he tried, to, he tried to help these people and then other people got angry at him. And he's like, I can't please everybody here. And, and matter of fact, the Bible even describes that sometimes he was so overwhelmed. He was just so tired he couldn't do this anymore that the bible says it's sometimes he just he just walked right away from crowds of people because he just he just couldn't give anymore he was absolutely tapped he knows what it's like he knows he knows so he can identify with us and he brings victory in all of these things and he can bring victory in your life through even these these horrible, difficult things that we face. We know what it's like to be disappointed. We've all been disappointed. Sometimes in disappointment, you can feel so down, you just feel like you can't even breathe. You're just so disappointed. You work so hard for something, and it didn't come true. Or you ever been so disappointed in yourself? Like, I, I didn't... I didn't do my best, or I didn't reach that goal. You're just disappointed. And, you know, you ever, you ever plan a vacation for a whole year? You're all excited about it, and you go, and everything goes wrong? And you come home just feeling like you wasted time, you wasted money, you're so disappointed, you were so built up for that, and you're disappointed. Or, or, or you ever been disappointed, I mean really disappointed, that you didn't get a job that you were hoping for? Or you didn't get accepted into a school that you were hoping to go to. And I've experienced disappointment just from, from going to the doctor and, and having surgery on my eyes and, and like, that didn't work. Like, that disappoint, disappointing feeling. And during that, you could say, where's God? God, you don't understand. How come you don't? You know, God, how can you help me in this situation? Oh, he can. And he does. And he can do it effectively because Jesus Christ came to this earth and experienced that very same thing. He experienced disappointments. I mean, such disappointments. There's stories in the Bible where, you know, he had these 12 guys with him, these apostles, and he spent all of his time with them, and he was teaching them, and he was showing them things. And there's several times in the Bible Jesus would say, okay, guys, I've showed you to do this. Now, now you go do this, or you go help these people. And they'd screw it up. I mean, they would, and, and I would love reading the Bible, and, and Jesus just says to them, how long do I have to deal with you guys? <laughs> I mean, you can see the disappointment of, of Jesus just being so, so disappointed, like, guys, 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 oh, come on, I thought you'd get it by now. 
He didn't get it. He understood disappointment. But he was victorious through all of it. He experienced it to the core. And he was victorious over all of it. And you think, well, Jesus maybe never experienced loss of a loved one. I know some of you have. And it doesn't matter how many years ago that you lost a family member or somebody close. This time of the year, it seems to open that wound all over again. It seems like it's just so fresh again and the hurt and the emptiness and the sorrow is there. And you ask, God, don't you understand? God, can't you help? Yes, he does understand. Jesus Christ came to this world as a human being to experience every pain and suffering that we experience. He experienced a loss, the death of friends. When he was here on this earth, he experienced one one friend was very, very close to him, Lazarus. And you know what? When when the word came that Lazarus, Jesus' close friend, had passed away, it's the shortest verse in the whole Bible. It's two words. It says, Jesus wept. The heartbreak, the pain, the emptiness of a loss of a loved one. He's experienced that. He's experienced these things that we have. And I think one of the worst things to experience in life is betrayal. Betrayal. Have you ever been betrayed by somebody? It hurts, don't it? Betrayed by a friend. Somebody you've known for years. Somebody that you were, you've confided in. And then you find out that they said something behind your back. Or they turned on you with another group of people. And with today's social media, it can be even vicious. It can, it can be out there so, so much more with all the ways of, of, of uh, letting people know how you feel. And people turn on you. It hurts deep, doesn't it? It hurts so deep. And I know some of you have experienced such unspeakable pain through the betrayal of a spouse. Or maybe your parents betrayed you. Or maybe by a partner. Maybe you have felt betrayal from the place that you worked for for 25 years. You felt betrayal. And that That pain of betrayal, it hurts so deep and it hurts so bad. And again, you could could be wondering, like, I can't, I don't know what to do with this pain. And nobody understands it. Oh, you might have had something like it, but you don't understand. God loves us so much. He doesn't just say, I understand. He became a human being to live the experiences that we live because Jesus knows the pain of betrayal. And many of you know the story. But one of his 12, one of his closest friends, one who was with Jesus, and he saw Jesus raise people from the dead. He saw Jesus walk across the water. He he was there when Jesus said they were in a boat in a storm and they thought they were going to drown. And Jesus said, be calm, be still. And everything calmed down. He was there to see Jesus do miracles. He was there to hear Jesus' teachings. And one night behind Jesus' back, he went to the enemies that Jesus had. And for money, he sold Jesus out for where he would be so that they could capture him. Betrayal. Jesus knows how it hurts. He knows how deep it is. But Jesus Christ went through all of the things that we go through in life. He experienced every one of them so that he could empathize, that he could understand what we go through. But even more than that, to bring victory into our lives, to work with us in our lives, that none of us have to go through these things alone. None of us us have to experience these difficult, painful, scary things in life by ourselves, that he is always with us. And I love what the Bible says about, I'm sorry, it says this, in this world you will have trouble. We're going to go through these things in this broken world. But take heart, 
I have overcome the world. That Jesus Christ came here as a human being to experience all of the pains and sufferings in life. And then he was victorious over all of them. That he has overcome these difficulties and these problems and these areas of our life that are so hard and, and so such a struggle for us. And he's brought victory. And he can bring victory in our lives. As a matter of fact, that's why he came to identify with us. Whatever it is you're going through, Jesus Christ can honestly look you in the face and say, I understand. I've been there. And I can help you through it. I want to be with you through it. Nobody else can like Jesus can. Be with you in your darkest hour, in your, in your most difficult time. He can be there with you. And he makes a difference in our lives a victory of so so grateful that Jesus Christ is real and alive and that he was a, a human being and could identify with us. I know in my life, in my own life, I have been at times, just like you, we're no different, been at times in my life that I, that I felt I have no idea what the future holds. I don't know what to do with the decision, I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't, and and you, know, you know what it's like when you're, you don't know the future. Should I go? Should I stay? Should I quit? Should I join? Should, you know, should I buy? Should I sell? What should I do? Jesus Christ wants to be with us to help us through that. He, he brings us victory in everyday life because he understands everyday life. He identifies with us. I have asked him in the, the difficult times of my life, I have asked him, Jesus, work with me. Give me direction in my life. Help me with what to do. And he has. God has directed my life. God has helped my life. God has led my life. Sometimes it's through opening doors of circumstances. Sometimes it's through reading the Bible. It just jumps out at me like I know that God is speaking to me on what to do. And there have been so many difficult times in my life. And I've shared many of them in church, but times in my life that I felt so empty. You know, I know many of us, we struggle with maybe some of the things of life, disappointments, betrayals, sometimes just feeling, you know, invaluable. And it brings sometimes, have you ever been there where you just feel, you just feel empty? That's where Jesus Christ makes a difference, that he can identify with us and he makes a difference in our life. And I know for me personally, Jesus Christ has given me more joy in my life than anything else in this world could offer. That Jesus Christ has given me joy in the down times. He's given me strength in the difficult times. He's given me directions in the times I don't know. And he has worked in my life. And he can work in your life. As a matter of fact, he came because he wants to identify with us and work with us in our life. But you might be thinking, yeah, I believe in God, but I've never, he's, Kevin, he, maybe he's directed you and maybe he's helped you. He's never helped me. That may be true. But maybe you've never asked him. This, I love what Jesus says here. He says, here I am. He's here. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock of our life. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person. And they with me. See, Jesus said, I've come to this world to experience everything you have. I understand. I can relate to what you're going through, and I want to help you in whatever that situation is. I want to come into your life and be a part of your life. I'm standing here waiting. I, I want to. It's what, I, it's what I'm about. But he says, you have to let me in. You have to let me into your life. I can't help you in your life if you ignore me. I can't help you in your life if you don't want a relationship with me. You know, I can't. You're keeping me out. 
I'm wanting to help you. I'm wanting to work in your life. I'm wanting to get you through these situations. I understand your fears and your, your difficulties and your struggles. I understand and I want to help you. But I can't unless you invite me to be a part of your life. My question to you tonight, do you want Jesus Christ to be a part of your life? That's why he came. That's why he became a human being. He wants to be a part of your life. I want to pray for us in just a, just a moment here, but before I do, I, 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 know that, I know that we probably all pretty much believe in God. And I know some of us go to church a lot, some of us don't. This is not a church thing. This is a, this is a God, are you in my life thing. And if you, have, if you have never said, Jesus, I want you to be a part of my life. If you've never done that, I want to pray with you tonight. What a great way to celebrate Christmas. The whole reason he came was to be a part of our life. And I want to give you an opportunity. I'm going to pray, and I want you to just pray with me. Just say, Jesus, I invite you into my life. I mean, you're, you're offering to be a part and help me. I just want to say, yeah, come on in. And as we bow our heads, just so nobody sees or is looking around, as we bow our heads and I start to pray, if that's you, will you lift your hand up to God? I mean, really, it's serious. Don't, don't think about lifting your hand up for me or anybody. What you're doing is you're saying, Jesus, I'm saying yes to you. I'm asking you to be a part of my life. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be here tonight. I thank you for Christmas. I thank you for a Savior who was born into the world. It's just joy to the world. There's joy to everybody, the Bible says, who says yes to you. Everybody who would allow you to be a part of their life. And we have a choice. We can say, I don't want you, Jesus, to be a part of my life. But we also have a privilege to say yes to you, Jesus. If you want to say yes to Jesus right now, just raise your hand and say, Jesus, I want you to be in my life. I want you to be a part of my life. I want to be guided by you. I want to be strengthened by you. I want to feel your presence in my life. I invite you to be a part of my life. I say yes to your invitation. Come and be a part of my life tonight. May I feel your presence and your strength. Help me in all of my situations in life. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.